thank you very much to the organizers for running this brilliant seminar. I'm a long, long-term fan. Uh, so uh, today I want to talk about this kind of newly observed phenomenon in number theory that's been called murmurations. And I will try to loosely structure my talk as follows. I'll begin by discussing some kind of classical well-known things about statistical properties of module forms. And then I'll move on to this kind of newer thing and maybe try to explain uh, what it is and why it's called that. Uh, okay, so I will denote, I'll start with just a little bit of notation. Um, I will denote the space of weight K class modular forms for gamma of n with this um, SK of n. Uh, and I will let HK and be the simultaneous, um, uh, the simultaneous um, eigenbases of all the heck operators. So uh, modular forms, of, of course, have a Fourier expansion, which since we're looking at cusp forms, we'll start at n equals one. Uh, and for the heck basis, I will always want to normalize the Fourier coefficients in such a way that if one is equal to one, the standard normalization. Uh, now, when we normalize the heck eigenbase in such a way, uh, a classical result of Eichler for k equals two and then Delina generality says that uh, these coefficients, they will be bounded in absolute values. So they will satisfy uh, the Ramanujan Peterson bound uh, and will always be at most two times p to the k minus one over two. And I will um, denote this like renormalized coefficient scaled down by p to the k minus one over two with uh, the letter lambda. Uh, and further, since the parameter lambda is trapped between minus two and two, I can always find an angle um, uh, you know, an angle of theta FP such that, which is determined on, almost uniquely such that I can encode this parameter lambda F of P with uh, this, this angle. Uh, of course, this angle has kind of a deeper interpretation in terms of Frobenius traces. So in terms of Frobenius eigenvalues, and I will use Frobenius traces and um, Fourier coefficients sort of interchangeably. Okay, so the general theme of this talk is how do these parameters, how do these trap parameters distribute when um, we start to vary um, some of the other parameters involved in, in the setup. So how do, or, or kind of more generally, if we consider some kind of family of automorphic forms uh, ordered in some way, what can we say about the distribution of Fourier coefficients? Um, okay, so there are two, modes in which I want to think about such a thing. Uh, the first mode is when I fix the form and I vary the prime, and this is like the so-called horizontal distribution, I think is referred to in the literature as horizontal, usually. Uh, and this story, of course, starts with uh, the conjectures of Sato and Tate from the 60s, who independently, uh, Sato computationally and Tate, based on his study of algebraic cycles, conjectured that uh, this uh, par parameter a p for elliptic curves follows a semicircle distribution. So uh, since elliptic curves have interpretation, uh, since, since point counts of elliptic curves have interpretation in terms of uh, Fourier coefficient, coefficients of modular forms, uh, by, by studying point counts of elliptic curves, we can also formulate conjectures about um, coefficients of modular forms and uh, the conjecture now theorem of Sato and Tate about elliptic curves uh, states that if, if, if we consider an elliptic curve over Q, which is not CM, and we encode uh, its point counts with the same kind of angle theta E of P, then for any two angles between zero and pi, it, it will always be the case that the proportion of angles that falls between um, alpha and beta will converge to a number. Uh, and that number can be determined from the Sato Tate distribution sine squared theta d theta. Um, and you know, to figure out what that number is, we just take the, the proportion um, of that distribution that is trapped between alpha and beta. Uh, and the semicircle picture at the top uh, would correspond to the distribution of the lambdas, what I called lambdas before, which will be symmetrically distributed between minus two and two in this kind of normalized semicircle way. Okay. Yes, and and that generalizes to not just elliptic curves, but you know, for for, for an arithmetic L function for form pi, we expect there to exist a group G sub pi, 
such that the angles will always distribute according to the Haar measure in such a group. So here, uh, the relevant group would be SU2, and the statement is that point countable to curves over finite fields distribute in the same way as a trace of a random matrix in SU2. Okay. Uh, now kind of the orthogonal direction that we can look at is if we fix the prime and vary the form. And to formalize this, we will want, we want to think of like packets of forms. Uh, so we want, to, we want to have a parameter n, which will usually be something like the conductor or a height ordering. Uh, and we want to consider packets of primes, which I'll denote with f sub n, uh, which are just forms, sorry, packets of forms, which are forms which have conductor that is you know, up to little o of one multiplicatively of size capital N. Uh, and in this setup, there's kind of an orthogonal question that we could ask. And you know, there's a famous result there and Conry Duke and Farmer independently, uh, which, which, which says that kind of the same thing happens. If instead we go upwards and we fix the prime P. So for example, if we take the packet to be our favorite basis of Hecke eigenforms, and we ask the same question where proportion of theta is fall between alpha and beta, uh, then there will once again be in the limit as either the weight or the level goes to infinity. There's again a distribution that we can write down, uh, a measure called the piatic Poncherel measure, uh, such that we can always figure out what proportion of angles asymptotically uh, will fall between any alpha and beta based on this measure. Uh, and this measure is not exactly the side of tape measure, but maybe you can convince yourself that it converges to the side tape measure uh, as p goes to infinity, as it probably morally should from some you know, changing order of summation or the ch changing order of limits type heuristic. Okay, and uh, similarly for, for mass forms, one can ask the same question and the answer once again has the same shape. So if we, if we look at mass forms for SL2, um, and we ask what proportion of p Piece, um, eigenvalues of piece Hecke operators fall between alpha and beta, then once again, we can write down a measure. Uh, and in the limit, as the eigenvalue grows, we get convergence. Okay, uh, now a kind of lower order question that we can ask is a question of uh, linear correlations, linear correlation statistics or, or moments. So we have these two, or three now distributions, you know, when things move in various directions, we know that angles have to distribute according to those distributions, but that's, there are other questions that can be asked about the behavior of, of the angles. Uh, and one such question, uh, which is kind of finer, finer not in the sense that it's harder, but in the sense that it's lower order is the question of moment. Um, so, and here again, we can go in different directions. So horizontally, this would uh, amount to fixing form pi and now looking at a packet of primes. So looking at some set of primes that multiplicatively of size x. Uh, and uh, the, the first moment of, of um, the distribution of a, a pi for this form would just be the average as x goes to infinity of a sub pi of p um, for, for p in this packet. Um, that we denoted with px. Uh, and so for a question like this, uh, what we will see is, okay, we've already seen that kind of on average, all the distributions we've seen were symmetric about, about the origin. So maybe heuristically, one would expect that um, for, many, for many families, like the ones discussed earlier, one should expect convergence to zero. You know, in some cases, probably so. Uh, but it turns out that the precise manner in which this average goes to zero can also encode uh, very interesting arithmetic information. So for example, for certain class of L functions, arithmetic L functions, uh, it turns out that an average of this form uh, will, so it will decay like square root of X, uh, but if one now bumps it up by square root of X to make it a size one again, then this will be an almost periodic function. Uh, and in fact, um, this is just a reformulation of what is known as Tubashaw's bias about the number of primes, which are three versus one on four, uh, if the function is chosen careful. Okay, uh, now in the vertical direction, 
Uh, same question can be asked, what is the average of a sub pi of p's when uh, pi now varies in a family of fixed conductor size, roughly. And here, what uh, the type of result that one will see is, you know, for example, for geometric families of, of uh, curves, uh, there will also often be convergence to a number, and but that number is now uh, not necessarily always zero. Uh, so for nth moments of the distributions of uh, point counts of elliptic curves over finite fields, um, the moments have been computed by Birch, and it, it is a theorem that as uh, the index of the moment becomes larger, uh, we always have to have convergence to the moments of the Fadotate distribution. Uh, but in the same paper, Birch also noticed, and that's uh, kind of a, an, an easy, nice, easy exercise, that the distribution of um, A sub P's is always going to be symmetric about zero. Uh, so not only does it have to approach the nth moment of Sato Tate and, and becomes large, but it's also it's always uh, going to be symmetric about zero, like the Sato Tate distribution. Uh, so in particular, it means that if we want to consider a family of elliptic curves ordered by uh, naive height, then a correlation like the one above will always have to converge to zero as x goes to infinity. Okay. Um, but yeah, like I mentioned, uh, for other geometric families, uh, point counts over finite fields do not necessarily always have to be zero, but they can be computed from monodromic computations. And at infinity, this when Q goes to infinity, um, it, it still does have to go to zero. That's Katz, Deline, Deline Katz have distribution. Okay, uh, the, the main subjects of this talk will be kind of in the diagonal direction. And now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and try to explain what this murmuration mur mur business is all about. Uh, so the story of uh, the subject starts with a paper that was written by Healy, Oliver, and Pognikov, uh, who were trying to do the following. They would look at uh, different number theoretic objects and take a limited amount of data about these number theoretic objects. And based on that limited amount of data, would try to find ways to statistically predict um, invariance of these objects. So for example, one instance that a lot of people are interested in is trying to guess ranks of elliptic curves. And what they were doing is they would take elliptic curves, they would take, they would take an elliptic curve, take a limited amount of uh, point counts over small finite fields for this elliptic curve. And based on that limited amount of data, they would try to figure out what the rank of the curve is. Um, of course, you know, the BSD conjecture predicts that just based on point counts, one should be able to eventually uh, be able to predict what the rank is, but uh, what they were doing is taking a relatively small number of p's uh, instead of uh, looking at the L function as a whole. And what they discovered uh, in their studies is that if one considers uh, the following family, so take the family E uh, that has three, par three parameters, R and one and N2, uh, which is the family of elliptic curves over Q with ring equal to R, and uh, conductor between N1 and N2. Uh, so what they noticed is that if one considers uh, a correlation with the prime P of this family in the same sense in which I've been uh, discussing up until now, then the resulting object is an interesting function of P over N, uh, or interesting function of P rather. So what do I mean by interesting function? Here's a graph from their paper and the graph depicts the following. So here we're taking uh, the x-axis to be the prime p that we're taking a correlation with. The family that we're correlating with is fixed. Uh, so the family, the set of elliptic curves is a finite set of elliptic curves with conductor in uh, 7,000, 7,500, 10,000. And there are two data sets here. Uh, there's a blue data set and a red data set. And the blue one corresponds to all elliptic curves with conductor in that interval of rank zero, and the red one corresponds to all elliptic curves with conductor in that interval of rank one. And each dot on this graph is, uh, we, we, we take the point on the x-axis, which is the index of some prime p, 
Uh, and for one of these two families, we compute the averages of uh, A, E of P's for E in that family. Okay, I hope it's clear uh, what's depicted here. Uh, and similarly, if one considers instead of rank zero and rank one, uh, a slightly different, uh, if, if one considers that instead of rank zero and rank one, rank zero and rank two, then a slightly different picture emerges uh, where, so in the first picture, we kind of got these two waves that are crossing each other um, at various points of the x-axis and that are changing fine. Uh, in the second picture, it looks like the waves are kind of aligned, uh, although the green one is shifted down. Uh, and here, I just want to point out that, you know, maybe heuristically, one would expect that curves uh, of lower rank would also have, loosely, loosely speaking, lower point count for a finite field. So the thing that we're seeing in the beginning where, you know, rank zero curves seem to have uh, slightly larger APs is something that maybe one could heuristically expect. Uh, but what's interesting here is that they actually, they, they it's, it, it seems at least like they keep switching orders uh, and they keep flipping um, from positive to negative. Um, okay, and so here's the, the canonical picture of birds, which apparently looks like this. Uh, I don't know if you believe me or not, but that is the source of the name that uh, the four authors uh, named this phenomenon murmurations. Um, so what happened then is that this paper was noticed by Drew Sutherland, who, by the way, uh, has given an excellent talk in the seminar earlier this year or in the fall. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, to rewatch that talk or watch that talk if you haven't seen it, um, which expands, it, it expands much more broadly on uh, some comp computations that go into this. Uh, so uh, Drew Sutherland, after discovering that paper, performed some further computations alone and with the four authors. Um, and so he did a couple of things. One thing that he did is to try to regu regularize what's going on. So uh, if you look at, if you look here, there's kind of these three parameters, okay, rank, understandable, but there are these parameters N1 and N2 that uh, in these pictures are chosen kind of arbitrarily. Uh, uh, but, uh, to try to normalize a picture, it makes sense instead of taking, instead of having two free variables, uh, we can just fix the interval to always be dyadic. Uh, and if we do that, now we only have uh, a dependence on one parameter n. Uh, and it turned out that uh, when um, we renormalize the family, in this, when, when we prescribe that the family has to have a conductor uh, in a dyadic interval, uh, then it's, it starts to look like there's some kind of invariance on a p over n scale that we see in the pictures. So here's what I mean by that. Uh, let's start taking capital N's to be powers of two. Uh, they don't have to be powers of two for this to hold, but just for the sake of the picture. Uh, so when we do that, it starts to look like, oh yeah, so capital N is power of two. And then let's take p instead of moving arbitrarily, let's take the prime P going exactly up to capital N. Uh, so what that amounts to is kind of rescaling the x-axis. X-axis, instead of being a, a prime P, it becomes like a, fu a function of, or a plot of P over N. Uh, so when we do that, it starts to look like the picture that emerges kind of replicates itself. So of course, we're gonna have more and more points, the, the larger the capital N, because we're looking at all the elliptic curves of conductor in that larger and larger interval. Uh, but uh, it appears as though the line that your eye uh, involuntarily draw, draws through that curve, it appears that the, that line becomes stable. So for example, all the crossing points align. Um, okay, now you may ask, if we're hoping to prove something about elliptic curves, uh, the easiest approach to, or the, the most natural approach to start trying to do that would be to order elliptic curves by something other than the conductor, because the conductor ordering is somewhat elusive. You know, we don't even know how to properly count elliptic curves by conductor. So perhaps if we're hoping to 
prove something here, it would make sense to start trying to order by something else. But unfortunately, it looks like uh, when the ordering is changed to something more tractable, this phenomenon disappears. So uh, it's, it starts to look like random noise. And finally, elliptic curves are just one instance of a family of L functions corresponding to modular forms. What if we start asking about other L functions? So elliptic curves, of course, correspond to way two forms uh, that have Galois orbits of size one. But if instead we start asking about Galois orbits of higher sizes, then for each uh, degree, there's a, its own picture that comes out of this computation. So here's d equals to one, two, three, four, five, and six. Uh, and then finally, if we consider the full family of modular forms, uh, then we get this picture at the bottom. Uh, so something unexpected happens, which is that this noisy picture that we've been seeing so far suddenly collapses into this nice clean line. Okay. So here's the picture again. Let me just reiterate what we're seeing here. So there are two families uh, corresponding to, oh yeah, uh, I should have emphasized that when we pass to modular forms from elliptic curves, we no longer have the rank. Okay, we have the analytic rank, but uh, a proxy in this picture for the rank is the, the parity of the rank. And so it's the root number of the corresponding L function. And the reason that that might be a good proxy is, well, we saw these two pictures with um, ranks zero and one and with rank zero and two. And it looked like the rank two picture is much more similar to the rank zero picture than the rank one picture is to either of them. So um, perhaps root number could be a good proxy for rank. And so here we're taking two families corresponding to root number plus one and root number minus one of all new forms uh, of, sorry, Hecke eigen basis of cut new forms for gamma naught of n, uh, weight k. Uh, and again, conductor, sorry, level now in a dyadic interval from x to x. And what this, what this graph is show, showing is a function. Um, so it's, it's secretly a function of two variables, uh, p and x. And in this picture, the value of x would be fixed. And this function is the expectation over uh, forms in this family of A sub F of P. Uh, and again, one of the colors corresponds to root number one, one corresponds to root number minus one. Okay, now the question is, what is this curve? Can we guess this curve? And the answer is yes. Uh, and that will be the, the main topic of my talk. Uh, so theorem, uh, so I'm going to state it first without um, dropping some conditions on the sizes of things, but the way you should think of this theorem is, okay, let, let's have X be a parameter going to infinity and, and P going up to capital X. Uh, so that's the same normalization that we had in, in the elliptic curves pictures. Then as X goes to infinity, then F of P comma X converges, always converges to a function. Um, so this function will be, there's two functions and one is the reflection of the other. So uh, F uh, P comma X will converge to epsilon times now a fixed function. So to plus minus epsilon, uh, plus minus M where M is given as follows. So it starts off as a sum of a square root of Y and a Y. Uh, and here alpha and beta are uh, explicitly defined numbers that can be written down in terms of a giant Euler product, but uh, I'm not gonna do that here. So it starts off as a piecewise, uh, it's a piecewise defined function that starts off uh, with square roots and y's. Uh, and then as we move on the zero one interval, there are other terms that start to come in that look a little bit more messy. And the reason this function is defined on zero one is again, because uh, up until now we have been thinking of the prime P as a parameter that goes up to capital X. So in particular P over X be trapped between zero and one. 
Okay. So now if, if this function looks maybe a little bit surprising to you for something that's so natural, uh, arguably the reason that it's not very clean is because uh, this is this is this is still not kind of the correct uh, family to consider uh, in the sense that secretly what is governing what is going on here is a more local average instead of taking um, n to be a parameter in dyadic interval arguably a more natural thing to do is to consider uh, families for which the conductor n lies in a short interval so where n is roughly of the size of x times one plus little of one, like we've been uh, looking at before. Okay, uh, and so it turns out that for this family, if we perform the exact same computation, uh, then the function becomes, at least in my opinion, somewhat nicer. So now there are only square roots, and again, explicit constant alpha, beta, and gamma that can be written in terms of big Euler product. So for this family of uh, new forms, cusp new forms, the conductor roughly of size x, uh, the same expectation will always converge to either plus or minus this nice function with a bunch of square roots. Okay, uh, and again, here, here I'm omitting some details in the statement, but let me just put an honest statement here. So let's take, uh, this is now for weight k. Up until now, we've been talking about weight 2, but this generalizes to arbitrary even weight. So let lambda f of p once again be this renormalized uh, um, Fourier coefficient of the form. Uh, and let x, y, and p be parameters going to infinity, uh, where we assume that y is a power saving from x and a prescribed power smaller than x. And p now, instead of going up to x, we can actually allow it to go to be a, a power of x that's slightly bigger than one, uh, and where delta one and delta two are uh, some some numbers that satisfy uh, linear inequalities, and let y be equal to p over x as before. Uh, then epsilon times uh, the following average. So if we so if we average in the numerator, we take again conductors. In, we take levels between x and x plus y, and then we sum over all forms of root number, either plus one or minus one, uh, this parameter lambda sub f p, multiplied by root p. Here, note the somewhat strange normalization. Uh, and we divide this through by the number of things that we're summing. Then this will converge to either plus or minus uh, times a function of p over x. Uh, and here, once again, we basically only have square root, except there's additionally these terms u, k minus 2, of r over 2 root y coming in, which are uh, Chibushov's polynomials. So these are just polynomials in the parameter r over 2 square root y. Uh, and this convergence happens with a power uh, decay. So uh, the error term decays like x to some negative power, which can be explicitly expressed in terms of delta 1 and delta 2. And here are some constants, just to explain why I haven't been writing them down until now. So they're, they're just given by gigantic Euler product, and I'll try to explain uh, a little bit where this comes from. Oh yeah, uh, one small caveat is that uh, this theorem is stated for summation only over square free, per, square free levels um, for technical reasons, but that condition can likely be dropped but the function will, the, not the function itself, but, but if one wants a, a similar statement for uh, all levels, then the function will look the same, except these alpha, beta, and gamma will be uh, slightly different. Okay. And let me just emphasize here that the normalization is a little bit strange. So when k is equal to two, then uh, the, the thing in the numerator, is pretty much the same or exactly the same as a f of p's, but for higher weights, uh, this is somewhat unusual normalization. So in some sense, it's lucky that elliptic curves are 
uh, correspond to forms of weight two because for elliptic curves, this normalization is, is exactly what one would expect. Um, okay, uh, here are some graphs of these curves uh, for uh, the index here corresponds to the weight. So uh, the top graph is the function M8. So it's a function uh, that these averages will converge to when k is equal to eight and the bottom one is 24. So at least at the origin, they look somewhat funky. Okay, so how does one prove such a thing? So the first step of the proof is to recognize that what we're actually looking at is uh, a correlation with a root number. So what I mean by that is that on average over the full family of um, modular forms, not split by root number, one would expect, one expects that the average of these coefficients a sub f of b's to be roughly zero. And what that means is that if one wants to split by root number, uh, that is the same as taking the sum correlated against the root number. So a f of p times epsilon of f summed over the full family is just uh, a f of p with root number plus one minus a f of p with root number minus one. Uh, and since their sum should be roughly zero, then we can reformulate the splitting into one correlation function. And this, so uh, this expectation correlated against the root number should be the same as um, the expectation for plus, plus one forms and uh, the negative of the expectation for the minus one forms. Uh, and the re reason doing this is advantageous is because we can actually reinterpret a correlation sum like this as a trace on the on the full space of modular forms. So correlation sum, or yeah, this correlation against the root number is just the trace uh, on the space of uh, new forms of the uh, convolution of atkin laner and the peth hecka operator. The peth hecka operator having AFP as an eigenvalue and the atkin laner having the root number as the eigenvalue. Okay, and once we know that it's a trace, the next natural step is to use the trace formula, uh, the Eichler, in particular, the eichler selberg trace formula, since we want to look at Heck operators on homework forms. Uh, so in this particular case, this trace formula has been uh, unraveled, uh, first by Yamauchi, but then there was a minor miscalculation in that paper, which was corrected in the paper of Skrupa and Zagia. Uh, and so this trace, can be re-expressed as a sum of a bunch of uh, Hurwitz class numbers. And here you can already see that a lot of the features of the formula that have appeared in the statement are already here. So we already have the polynomial here and we already have um, the sum over Rs between one and two root P over N. Uh, and uh, what are these What are these Hurwitz class numbers? Uh, They're pretty much uh, the usual class numbers except we don't restrain things to be primitive. Uh, so instead of uh, counting only primitive binary quadratic forms of equivalence, we count all of them and you know, weigh by the number of objects in the appropriate count. Okay. Uh, and by the way, a particular case of this has already been noticed by Kimball Martin. So this is kind of the P equals one case uh, of this bias, uh, who, uh, who has observed that there's always a square root and axis axis of um, positive root number forms as opposed to negative root number forms. And if you stare at this formula for long enough, uh, you know there'll be no Rs because P over N will go to zero. You can convince yourself that this should be true. Um, just because there should be rough, roughly root, uh, because the Hurwitz class number should be roughly size root N. Okay, and then the last step is, uh, since we're summing over N, uh, you know, we might not be able to get a grasp of individual class numbers, but maybe if we start to average over n, there's some hope that um, there will be convergence, uh, and indeed there is. So, uh, by the class number formula, um, by the Gauss class number formula, since we're here we're restricting ourselves to negative discriminants, uh, we can always express class numbers as uh, square root of d times special value of an L function. And because we're averaging n over a short interval, we can basically declare the square root of d part, part to be fixed. And so what this reduces to is averaging special values of L functions, where 
we plug in um, where, where we have these characters evaluated at linear and quadratic forms over short intervals. And, you know, one expands this into a, a, a Dirichlet series and each term of the Dirichlet series makes some complicated contribution to the final answer. And that's where these giant uh, Euler products come from. Uh, now, because these are also Hurwitz class numbers and not Gauss class numbers, one also has to do some, some sieving to keep track of square divisors. So Hurwitz class numbers can be reduced to Gauss class numbers um, by um, analyzing their square divisors. Uh, and uh, this process is rather combinatorially complicated so the, the most important step is to just keep comparing it to the actual function that we have from the data. And you know some number of times they won't match, but then eventually uh, the cycle has to break. So once the function is met, uh, we give this talk and uh, QED. OK, so properties of this function. So it turns out that there's maybe an even, even nicer way to rewrite this function just with Poisson summation which is in terms of Bessel function. And here again, we have um, these you know, multiplicatively defined coefficients, q of d. Uh, but now there's only a root y and a sum of a bunch of uh, infinite sum of Bessel functions. Uh, and the only dependence on k now is the index of this Bessel function. Uh, so if we, if we now plug in the asymptotics for Bessel functions, uh, something very interesting comes out of it, which is that um, so the inner sum here is absolutely convergent. It converges rather quickly because um, both it, this decays like x to the minus 3 halves in both d and s. Um, so uh, if, if you look at it, you see that this is a function that grows like y to the 1 fourth. Uh, and it's a sum of, um, uh, peri it's a sum of periodic functions with uh, Growing periods. Uh, so actually, what what this implies immediately is that this will be uh, an asymptotically periodic function. So if one allows larger and larger periods, it will be, it will get closer and closer to being periodic. Uh, and furthermore, so it's a function that grows like y to the one fourth with a constant error term, and the only dependence now on k is in this sine of um, minus one to the k over two. Now, if you remember the functions that I was showing you earlier, uh, that might sound a little bit surprising because they look completely different. Uh, but, oh yeah, and one last thing is that one can also computationally prove from, from this that uh, this function has to change sign infinitely off. Okay, yeah, so if you remember the functions M8 and M24 that I was showing you earlier, this might sound, sound a little bit surprising because they looked completely uh, nothing alike, but actually, so this is a plot of this uh, universal limiting function uh, for positive sign um, for k equals to 2 mod 4. For k equals to 0 mod 4, uh, it would have to be flipped. Uh, and here is the graph of minus m8 of y, now in a much further range of y from 10,000 to 11,000. And what you can see is that that function that looked very funny at the beginning is actually clearly repeating the pattern of the function above. Is just a vanity check. Oh, and here's so here's a normalized uh, graph of a sequence of graphs. Uh, so each stop in this picture corresponds to a value of k. Uh, and so as you can see uh, near the origin, so again, near the origin, things can behave poorly. But what you can see is that you know, when k is small, it, it looks, it already looks essentially periodic. And then uh, as k grows larger towards the origin, it becomes more and more complicated. That happens because of the Chbyshev polynomials in the formula. Okay, uh, now, so, uh, you know, historically, so to speak, uh, we started with dyadic averaging, and then we arrived to this local formula, and then you know, the dyadic formula uh, can be computed from the local formula uh, by integrating, uh, but it turns out that if we want to consider dyadic averages and things like that, um, or, or other or other uh, kind of smoothed averages instead of local ones, uh, then the behavior of this function, the smooth function, is completely different. So for the local function, we saw that it was an infinitely oscillating thing that changes sign infinitely often. Uh, but it turns out that 
if, if instead we consider dyadic averages or, or analogous smoothed averages for other smoothing functions, uh, then the function will always have to converge to uh, one half. So those gra that very first graph that looked like the line that we were seeing, you know, it was going up and down, but actually it turns out that uh, asymptotically, it always has to converge to one half. Uh, and so this statement might look uh, a little strange, but if we plug here, uh, plug in the function, uh, the characteristic function of the interval one, two into this formula, then this will correspond exactly to taking a dyadic average or taking the local average. Uh, and this convergence to one half, I can prove for smooth complexly supported weight functions, uh, but I can also prove for k at least six under RH, which might seem like an overkill, but perhaps it suggests that it should be also generally true. Um, so there's kind of two completely different behaviors that happen for local functions and for smooth functions where the local one keeps oscillating and the smooth one has to converge one half. Oh yeah, and so a kind of a natural question that one asks when they see the static average is, okay, does this function change sign? Where does it change sign? How often does it change sign? And uh, what this shows is that, first of all, it changes sign only finally many times. Uh, but second of all, um, if instead of taking dyadic inter intervals, we take interval one to C for any other value of C, once we start varying C for C very close to one, uh, the function will look uh, more similar to the, to, the, to the local one. And for C going up to infinity, it'll, it will just become pretty much one half. So as we vary the value of C, uh, we can prescribe the number of zeros to be anything we want. So perhaps for that dyadic average, num the number of zeros, the number of times it crosses, um, the x-axis is not um, a deep invariant. It, it can be controlled. OK, so now we've discussed and we've proved this uh, for one family of forms, for the family of um, polymorphic modular forms of fixed weight. Uh, then the next step is to ask, OK, is this unique by any means to, OK, we already know that it's probably not unique to modular forms because we've seen a picture emerge for elliptic curves. Uh, but what can be said in more generality? And there's already more results about other families. So the first result of this kind is a uh, paper by Andy Booker, uh, Bober, Min Lee, and David Laraduda, who showed that under GRH, if one instead fixes um, the level to be one and takes um, the weight to go to infinity, uh, then there's a, there's also a, a now not not quite a function, but there's also an average. The, there's also a, an asymptotic statement about where the averages have to converge uh, that can be written down. Uh, but here, you know, in the previous picture or up until now, we've been looking at individual p's, so we've been fixing the p. Uh, in this case, it turns out that there's some additional averaging on p that needs to happen. And so here's the exact statement. So assume GRH for L functions Dirichlet characters and mass form. Oh, uh, that is, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, there's a wrong order of slides. Okay, so uh, a, a similar result can actually be proven uh, for mass forms uh, of weight zero. And I'll show you, so the, both of these statements look essentially the same. The answer is the same in these two cases cases, and I'll show you the exact thing in a second. Uh, but so for the family of uh, fixed level uh, forms and for the family of mass forms um, ordered by, uh, yeah, ordered by eigenvalue, uh, there, there's also a murmuration that takes place. So here's this, the exact statement of the result for uh, mass forms. Assume GRH for L functions uh, of Dirichlet characters and mass forms. And take an interval. The interval has to be fixed. So fix an interval e uh, in R plus of positive measure. Uh, now again, there are these two parameters R and H that have to have a controlled growth rate. Uh, and the conductor is a is a parameter that you should roughly be thinking of as R squared, so square of the eigenvalue. Uh, then if we average, um, if we average eigenvalues. Correlated against the root number, um, 
of forms with rj close to r, so rj roughly of size r. And additionally, we average on a prime. Uh, so instead of p over n, once again, instead of p over n being a fixed point, we want p over n now to be in an interval. So we allow some variation. Uh, then this average will converge to now not a function, but but a measure. So there's a measure written down below, which when you evaluate on this on this interval, gives you the answer. And kind of from from the nature of this answer, uh, you can see that we couldn't possibly get away without the averaging because this measure is supported on uh, supported on the rational. So uh, there's no statement that we could possibly write for an individual p. Okay, uh, and I won't go too deeply into the proof, but the basic overview of the proof is the same. Reinterpret the thing as a trait, reinterpret the correlation sum as a trait, um, and use uh, the cell, now, now the Selberg trace formula. Uh, so the Selberg trace formula um, requires taking an analytic test function, and the test function that we take is uh, constructed from this clever function of Ingham, which is compactly supported and decays almost exponentially. Uh, and we use this function to approximate the characteristic uh, function of an interval. Uh, and then the trait formula has many, many terms, but the first term uh, is um, a special, once again, a special value of a certain character uh, times the Fourier transform of F. And one can do a lot of analysis and circle method to compute averages. So this, this L function, once again, can be replaced by some kind of average value, and then uh, one wins with some work. And this proof follows very closely the proof of the first result uh, of um, the authors, um, of, of the first four authors um, about the weight. And so the answer is exactly the same. The measure is exactly the same. Okay, uh, now there's also a picture for GL1. So one can formulate statements for L functions of Dirichlet characters or Hecke characters for imaginary quadratic fields. Uh, and finally, uh, we can go beyond GL2 for, for higher ends. Uh, there's also computational indication that there's some kind of murmuration phenomenon taking place. And if you wanna see more about that, let me just repeat. There's a wonderful talk by Drew where he discusses um, a lot of the computational results that uh, hold in these more general cases. Okay, and just a few words about why we need average not p here. So in the case of holomorphic forms, we could take an individual p. Uh, in the case of these other two families that I've stated results for, uh, we could not get away without average not p. And arguably the reason this happens is because the analytic conductor uh, is quadratic in the weight or, or quadratic in um, the Laplace eigenvalue and is linear in um, the level. So because of that, when we take, um, say, the weight in a short interval, capital K to capital K plus H, the total number of forms that we're summing is H times K, which is smaller than the analytic conductor. Curly N, you should think of as roughly being a size K squared. So the family is too thin, uh, whereas in the level aspect, uh, the first result I presented, we were taking capital N in an interval of size H, and the total number of forms is N times H, which is bigger than N. So perhaps the heuristic is that we want um, kind of empower more forms than the size of the conductor. And if we don't have that, then we need to do additional averaging on P to add in more forms. Okay, uh, I will just quickly say a few words about how this connects to one level density. So one reformulation of uh, one level density for the family of homomorphic forms split by root number or correlated against the root number is that if we take a smooth compactly supported function phi and a short function f, uh, then um, these kind of correlation sums uh, over the zeros of the L functions um, have to converge to uh, have to converge to an integral of the function f against um, this um, function w o. Here o stands for orthogonal because orthogonal family. 
Uh, and um, through, through Weyl's explicit formula, uh, we can rewrite this in terms of pretty much the same type of sum as what I was showing you before. So we can rewrite this uh, as a sum uh, of lambdas correlated against the root number. And here, by the way, you might start to see where this very strange normalization comes from in this one level density interpretation. It just arises uh, naturally, this lambda set of p times root of times root p. OK. And if we now introduce a similar function to what we had before for the eidetic averages, m sub phi uh, of p comma x, uh, for p being x to some power, uh, then this can be further rewritten using the prime number theorem as a convergence, uh, as, as a weak convergence of um, this function m sub phi to uh, the, the, the characteristic function of uh, one to infinity, one half the characteristic function of one to infinity. So um, through Weyl's explicit formula in the prime number theorem, the one level density statement can be reinterpreted in this convergence um, way, where again, m phi uh, is the same as the, the kind of smoothed, uh, smoothed functions we were looking at before. Uh, and if you stare at this, you'll notice that it would actually suffice to show this convergence uh, to show that m phi of uh, x to the c comma x converges to zero when c is less than one and to one half when c is more than one. Uh, but everything we've been discussing so far, first of all, it proves this, it reproves this. Um, but second of all, it, it, it tells us some, something much more subtle which is the exact behavior of this function when p is of size x to the one. So instead of just seeing where it converges in the two limits, we are actually analyzing what is happening in the middle, in the, in the range where uh, p is p over x is a constant. And the answer turns out to be this very complicated function uh, of p over x. OK, let's see. Oh. Uh, uh, the final two words that I want to say, and this is once again a picture of Drew, so for the third time, I'd like to refer you to his talk. Uh, so uh, we still don't have any theoretical results for elliptic curves. That's a very interesting, very open question. Uh, but so first of all, hopefully what I've told you today gives at least some evidence that maybe there's some hope uh, that at the very least, there, there is a phenomenon for elliptic curves, uh, because uh, as you may know, for elliptic curves of small levels, there's a lot of phenomena that, that happen for a while and then sort of dissipate. Uh, but maybe there are two reasons to hope why that's not true, why this persists as uh, n goes to infinity. So the first reason is that we do have a robust phenomenon for other families. And the second reason is that uh, I just want to show you. So up until now, the pictures I've been showing you have been for pretty small conductors. Maybe that wasn't very convincing, but here's a picture of what happens for conductors uh, of size two to the twenty-six. So, um, and at and, and at the bottom, I have another picture which computes kind of local averages um, for the 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 red curve or for the difference of the two curves. And as you can see here, the curve is getting thicker and thicker. But when we compute the averages, it is essentially not moving. Perhaps you can barely even see that it's uh, a GIF, but it's, it is indeed moving. But the average remains stable. So perhaps there's hope to think that this is not just a, an excess rank type phenomenon based on this. OK, thank you. That's all I have to say today. <laughs>